This video is brought to you by viewers like you. Thanks for letting me do this for so long. Oh, hello? Oh guys, you're early. The video's not quite done yet, so I think you might need to come back later? Yeah, no, there's, there's nothing to watch at the moment, so, uh, sorry about that. You ever see a game over in a place where game over shouldn't be? Even better, you ever see a game over in a game and it isn't actually a game over? I know that sounds confusing, but those two words carry a lot of weight and being told that you've messed something up only to have the rug pulled out from underneath you and be hit with a LOL get pranked bro is something I don't see all that often. Getting a game over is just something you don't really argue with, but apparently you can if the game isn't all that serious about it. I don't know, we'll have to figure it out as we go, but until then, tell me about a fake game over that you love in a comment down below. Remember, it ain't over until it's over, and even then, sometimes the universe is just fucking around. It keeps you on your toes. Despite some inconsistencies over the past 10 to 15 years, Mario RPGs have generally been pretty goddamn hilarious. The writing team haven't fallen into the same pitfalls as a lot of the other creatives, and even the more questionable offerings have had absolutely hilarious lines of dialogue in them. I really liked Mario & Luigi Dream Team for a lot of reasons, but the humour was working hard to smooth out some of the rougher edges. Dream Team is a Year of Luigi game, so it's somewhat representative of a less than ideal time at Nintendo, but it meant that you're doing a lot of exploring of Luigi's dreams and generally getting involved with everything to do with sleeping. This reaches a natural extreme at Mount Pajama Majama. Pajama. Ja, pajama ja, pajama ja? Oh, I've never been allowed to say that. Where these beefy Russian friends show the Mario Bros around and warn against getting too close to this mysterious fountain. Of course you give it a poke because you're just an older baby with a more virtual fork to stick in a tantalizing plug socket. And while you might think that the fountain would be poisonous and flick the bros with some kind of status condition, there are bigger plans at play here. So the good news is that it fully restores Mario and Luigi's HP and BP, which is always handy to have at your disposal in the middle of an adventure. The bad news comes from what happens next, because it turns out that the fountain water is so delicious that it kind of messes with their heads and sends them to sleep. And I fully understand that because one time I drank from a fountain and I was asleep for a long time. Mario and Luigi end up inside a dream so descriptive that it takes up two full minutes of a text crawl. But it sounds like they had a fun time taking mushrooms and growing to a ridiculous size. Once they've grown as large as a mountain, they realize that there's no reversing the mushroom's magic, and so the only logical conclusion to come to next is a game over, of course. So it's both a game over within the context of Mario and Luigi's dream, but also a summation of maybe why you shouldn't drink from the fountain. Except it isn't, because the game over is fake and you're brought back to the fountain with nothing except dreams of special mushrooms ringing in your ears. It has the vibe of being punished for doing something you were told not to do, but when the punishment is this fun, it almost feels like a small reward. Almost like a really good dream. <laughs> Do you reckon many people actually end up falling for fake game overs? I know they're meant as a bit of fun and a chuckle or two, but generally speaking it's pretty obvious what a game is doing here. What I like the most is when a game isn't trying so much to fall and confuse you, but is simply trying to get a reaction out of you. And the Futurama game from the early 2000s got a pretty wonderful reaction out of me. This game's actually really good despite some rubbery facial animations, but they were able to get most of the voice actors from the show to work on this too, and it helps give all the cutscenes the same funny energy as the show has in abundance. This also means that it carries over the same relaxed attitude towards death as the show, which out of context is a little wild to talk about, but you know, it's the year 3000. Technology means that heads can float in jars for millennia now. So if there was ever a game to be pretty chill about dying, it would be the Futurama game, and it really doesn't take long to play its hand. Your opening tutorial mission is to help Professor Farnsworth find a hammer, which is fairly menial, but seeing as though you find it underneath this giant pile of random shit, it has its own complications. 
However, there's not much of a puzzle to be solved here as Fry will pull the hammer from underneath the pile and gets absolutely demolished by all of it falling on top of him. Leading to a really early game over that perhaps hints that there's other ways of getting the hammer? Nah man, that was supposed to happen that way because this game needed some kind of explanation behind Fry respawning from inevitable deaths throughout the rest of the game. And so Farnsworth created this giant toaster that spits out another Fry. Listen, they didn't need this explanation, but it pays off in a big way because the stupid grin I had on my face when taking the load-bearing hammer led to such an unavoidable game over, it's such a satisfying feeling. Yes, it's the only option, but at least it gets the game over it deserves. It's a big day for load-bearing hammers everywhere. The N64 had a weird controller, didn't it? If that feels like a weird segue, that's okay because it really is, but I've recently been thinking about gaming controllers that have a stick in the middle for some reason. Everything on the market these days has a right stick, usually reserved for character movement, and a left stick, usually for moving the camera around your character, so it makes the N64 controller having just the one control stick such a weird part of gaming history. And yet, at the same time, I presume this is what Batman Arkham Asylum is referring to when it mentions using the middle stick to dodge gunfire. So there must be a way of playing Arkham Asylum with an N64 controller, and this is the only method of getting past this weird little first person section that always seems to find a way of killing me every time. Does anybody know of like any mods that let me play it on PC with an N64 controller? Is that what I need to do here? So of course, this is a fear toxin section in Arkham Asylum, which might not have the same effectiveness as it does in Injustice, where it, like, fuck. But they do end up being pretty terrifying sequences. The final encounter goes straight for the jugular though, and if you weren't scared before, you might be when your game starts to glitch out and crash, and now you're controlling the Joker, and now you're back with Batman, but it's third person, and whoops, now you're dead! There's no way of avoiding the shot of course, but it doesn't stop Arkham Asylum from slapping you with that game over, and a little hint that you just need to make use of the middle stick that you obviously don't have. You do have the option of selecting retry, at which point Batman will rise from his grave, and the game continues as normal. It does feel a little bit like the devs were finished with subjecting Batman to resurfacing trauma and decided to give the player something to worry about instead, but I don't know, that game over was pretty convincing the first time I saw it. I didn't notice the advice with the middle stick, so I genuinely thought I did something wrong and I needed to, I don't know, turn around and walk away as Joker or something? How do I disarm this clown man? To the surprise of literally no one, Metal Gear loves a good fake game over. This franchise generally likes to fuck with its audience a bit too hard sometimes, and Metal Gear Solid 2 is home to mind fucks galore once it decides to take a big dive off the deep end and have characters say nonsense like needing 61 scissors. Listen, I don't know what fish and mailed means, but I sent this diagram in the post? Is that what you wanted? The whole fish and mailed fake game over is a classic, there's no denying that, but in amongst all the other crap that goes on in the second half of this game, I feel like it fails to stand out somewhat as a uniquely fake game over. So like with most aspects of life, you gotta look at Metal Gear Solid 3 to see just how good something can be, and while the fake game over isn't quite as potent as some nuclear fission being mailed, Snake Eater is bold enough to work a fake game over into a boss fight. And goddamn is it effective! The Sorrow is one of the most memorable encounters in Snake Eater for a pretty obvious reason. The whole deal here is that the game keeps a track of who you've killed up until this point, and sends their ghost down this creepy river to impede you. It's a meditation on how the easy way out at the time tends to come back to bite you later, and it makes this boss fight very counterintuitive since you can't damage or even stun the ghosts. You are, however, given a fake death pill and are advised to use it to bamboozle enemies and bosses into thinking that you've met your unfortunate demise. It's the sort of fun gimmick which is rarely useful beyond a one time messing around with a boss before they wise up to your antics. Especially hilarious given how the boss has CIA training and is never fooled. But this is your one way ticket to, to a fake game over since the revival pill will stop the death being permanent. The Sorrow is the only time where this fake death and fake game over screen is necessary, and you can either keel over by choice or bring yourself back to life when Snake gets spooked a bit too hard by one of the ghosts. Either way, you'll be told that Snake is dead, but hey ho, sure looks like he isn't. If in doubt, drugs? The 60s were a really long time ago.
If you've been watching my recent videos, you may know where this is going. There's a bit of a sliding scale going on here when it comes to this topic, and I think I've decided that any fake game over that happens within the context of a boss fight is both way more convincing and also more satisfying when you find out that the game is just screwing around with you. With this in mind, you need to accept and understand that God of War Ragnarok has peaked with fake game overs in a way that I don't think will be challenged anytime soon. Not something that I would have expected before playing this game, since Santa Monica are more in the market for stylish combat and the whole one unbroken camera shot thing, so the idea that they've got the time to work in a fake game over is impressive and kind of shocking. Although when Thor is involved, I suppose anything is possible. I love this fight from start to finish, and it has the same kind of aura that wouldn't feel out of place among the best fights from traditional God of War games. Two huge guys with weapons just beating the ever-loving shit out of each other, and filling the silences in between with so much smack talking that it could be a rap battle if they had more rhythm. For the most part, it's a really even fight, which is a good chunk of the reason why it's so much fun, but then Thor starts getting the upper hand and you need to win a bit of button mashing to stay alive, but oh man, he is strong, so you really gotta do your finger and your wrist stretches or you don't have a chance. Except, wait, what's, what's this video about again? Oh yeah, fucker, you're supposed to fail this, and you will get smacked across the chops by Mjolnir, because how else are we gonna get to our fake game over? A game over made fake by the same weapon that got you there in the first place, because Thor uses Mjolnir to defibrillate Kratos and bring him back to life. Something about this makes me a little bit giddy, and the more I think about it, the more things I find to like. This would be a standard game over if it wasn't for Thor wanting to fight Kratos some more, and that is the kind of energy I need to see more in gaming. Effectively, a fourth wall break that Thor has willed into existence at Kratos' and the player's expense. That is some grade A level power right there. More please! And yeah, those are the best fake game overs in all the video games. Do you agree or is there something else you'd have at number one? Let me know in a comment down below. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure you like it, subscribe for more, and hit that bell for notifications of every new upload. Last week, I talked about exciting chasing, so make sure you go watch that. And I also want to thank my top supporters on Patreon, including Sarah Malion, Christopher Robinson, and Lima Pro. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.